happening. Today, we are having Feast with Families. So we are going to, after this, reset everything and uh, put up some tables and put up the food and get that all ready to go. And we are going to have a great time eating together. And because everybody was either sick or had to go out of town, we will have homemade ice cream in a bag for anybody who wants to shake it up and make it. So, so uh, But that's happening today. And then tomorrow is uh, Bible study. Um, uh, Living Word Kids Club right now is over for the summer. We'll figure out what we're going to do if we're going to pick something back up on that Wednesday night. But we'll get together and discuss that. On your far away calendar, women, please mark October 25th and 26th. That is going to be our women's retreat. And we are going to be having that at Patsy's house. It is an overnighter. So I'm um, going to bring your jammies and we'll bring some air mattresses and we will just have a party. Oh, and she has four or four bedrooms. You can stay in a real bed if you want. I'm just all about the air mattress. I got real excited about camping out in the living room. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, we can all hide away. But we are going to have a great time at that. We are going to have like a little planning meeting so we can get our theme together and uh, invite some people out to make that a really wonderful event. So this week... I was um, scrolling, I, I was by myself at the office, in a few minutes I was scrolling through Facebook to look for something, and this is what I found. It is the Target Denim Take Back event. So if you bring in any clothing, pants, shirts, jeans, hats, and more, in any condition, you will receive 20% off bonus for dropping off those items at limit five per uh, household, and you can then get 20% off of your next denim purchase. So I have to tell you that several years ago, my mother um, always made sure that my dad and I had plenty of what we needed. But my mother didn't have um, any jeans. She had just, uh, the jeans she had just weren't fitting, and she's like, I need some jeans. And so she went to the Salvation Army thrift store, and she bought herself some jeans. And she bought about five or six pair, and she brought them home, and she washed them up. And then all of a sudden, a store called L.S. Ayers, L.S. Ayers is like Dillard's, was having the same type of sale. And it brought that memory back to me, and that they were giving so much off per jean that you brought in. So my mom said, well, I can get myself a new pair of jeans. So she took her six new pair of jeans that she had gotten from the thrift store and traded them in to get six new pair of jeans. Uh, uh, from the, and it just made me laugh. So what I'm thinking, if I can have, I need Zaretta and Liz and Kirsten to come up just for a second. Just stand right up here. I just need the three of you. And then I'm, I'm going to need, um, uh-oh. Then I'm going to need uh, Joe to stand because he's the only person I can see that, that fits my next thing. So this is what's going to happen. You guys are going to stand right here. So this is what's going to happen. You're going to bring in your jeans that are a little used like Joe's here. And then you are going to get money to trade off to get new jeans like this for free for a discount, 20% off of jeans with holes. You bring in your jeans with no holes. They're going to recycle them, put them in holes, and resell them to you in a couple of years. That's exactly what it's going to be. Thank you. That's all I needed you for. I love the idea. I, I know. I love those pants. They're so cute, aren't they? I'm not allowed to wear that kind to work. I just thought I would say that, but that's okay. But what I think is amazing is in my head, as I was thinking it through, they wanted us to bring our old jeans. And I'm thinking, it, it, they're just taking back all types of denim. And they're going to go, they're going to recycle them into what? Just a different new kind of, they're going to put different colors of jeans all together. We're going to have patchwork jeans next. That's what it's going to be. But this is what the scripture says. In Ezekiel chapter 11, verse um, 19, it says, in eight, starting in 18, it says, they will return to it, return to the way of the Lord. Uh, no, they will return to it and remove all of its uh, images and detestable idols. I will give them an undivided heart. I will put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them a heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. 
It's amazing what the Lord can do with the old stuff that we bring him. He can make some amazing stuff. So as you think about it this week, give him all your old stuff. Let him upcycle it and make it shiny and new. What an amazing thing that the Lord does for us. I'm going to ask if the children will go with Elsa and Bethany. The children are going to go with Elsa and Bethany to Children's Church. Pastor. All right, perfect. So uh, just bless them as the age groups have changing. There's a big space in there uh, so they get to, to entertain themselves that way. But what an amazing thing that the Lord will do. Was and I'm excited about it. Let me, let me turn on my, uh, my mic so people online, so Janie can hear, because she'll be sending me text messages on my iPad. I can't hear you. Some people consider that a blessing, a good thing. So it's a, it's a new series, and I'm doing something new. I know that's scary for some of us, probably more me than you, because uh, you can always get up and leave. I have to go till I'm finished, you know. No, I'm kidding. It's not going to be like that. Uh, the new series is called The Good Work, and, and I wanted to try to find something creative for it. I was actually going to focus on this one individual who is one of my favorite in the Old Testament, probably one of my favorite in the whole Bible, um, but uh, uh, today I, I wanted to look at not just his prayer life, which is absolutely incredible. I mean, it's something Joe and I have been talking about prayer. But here's what I want to tell you. I want to tell you that you, this is for the church, this is for those of you who are Christians, if you are the best of the best, you know, you're the star athlete or teacher's pet, there are some of you out there I know who are teacher's pets, and if, uh, if you're, you know, you're a leader of people, they follow you, and you have all these great talents and things that you can do, I want you to know that God can still use you, even if you're all of those things. That's because the God that we serve, he specializes in using not the cream of the crop. He uses everyday, ordinary people for extraordinary tasks and missions and jobs. And we're going to look at someone today who did that very thing. He was one of those things. This is a talk, a message, a series for those people who believe that they were created for something more. That deep down in the very fibers of their being, they know that they were born for a purpose. Created to do something that will outlast them. Something eternal. Something that matters. Something that lasts. So that's what we're going to do. The potential uh, over the next four weeks, the, the potential to change the course of a life is right here. And it's more so if you have people around you that hear these things. And here's what I want to tell you. Uh, now, I, I do want to warn you, though. When you give your life to God, when you say to God, all right, I want to do something that's more. I want to start a work that is so big. I remember a, a capital campaign that Sharon and I did. And, and when we, then we looked at, I, I crunched all the numbers. I looked at the the community, the economy, and the needs of the community of the, of the city. And I said, we're going to do a capital campaign of this amount. And my board members went, wait, wait, what? Did you put the decimal point in the wrong place? I said, no, 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 no. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to attempt something so big, so radical, like, that no one can claim credit for doing it except God. Something that's so much bigger than, than I'm able to do, being a new person in this community, and that you are able to do, knowing all the people who have resources to give. Something that's bigger than any of us can do. That's what I'm talking about today. But when you put yourself in that position, I want to warn you that, that it always comes at a cost. There's always a price attached 
to it. And you may pay, you may pay a price that's bigger than you imagined. It may be bigger than you could ever conceive. It may be pain. It may be agony, rejection, frustration, heartache. It may be failure, loneliness. You may at times have doubt that you will ever accomplish what God has placed before you to do. Discouragement. You may also, during that work that God has placed for you, if you step out in faith and say, this is what God wants me to do, you may experience loneliness. You may stand alone. You may be criticized or mocked or laughed at, misunderstood. All of those things, those are costs that come with stepping out in faith and doing something that everyone else says is crazy, unachievable. You can't do that. Well, in that little, they're right. You can't do it. But God. And I want to tell you that even with the cost, when, when, you, uh, when your sacrifices make a difference in the lives of other people around you, you will never think about that price that you paid. You won't. We used to say this all the time. If, if for instance, Kids Club, we just got done with it, and it was a lot of work for Sharon and the, and the volunteers to come in, sacrifice time, give radically of their time and their talents. We had... You know, one gentleman who spent every night after he got done from work the whole week sawing, well, he didn't saw, I mean, he had power, to, but he cut little pieces of wood to make little wooden robots like Robbie who's taking a nap over there in the green screen. Re there's a cost involved, but when you do that and when did that we said if one child comes to an understanding of who Christ is in their life, it's all worth it. We will not think about the price paid. We'll think about that person now coming into the kingdom of God as a child of, their, of his. The world will be different because you took a risk. You stepped out in faith. You gave generously of your time or your talents or, or your treasure. You obeyed God. And you may look like an ordinary person on the outside. Everyday person, nothing unusual about you. I was going to say a regular Joe, but we don't have any of those. He's anything but regular. That's who God uses. Common, everyday, normal people. So the person that we're going to study in the Old Testament, if you, if you looked ahead or you, or you figured it out, it's Nehemiah. Nehemiah was heartbroken for his people. He heard what was going on back in his hometown. And he decided at some point along the way that he couldn't just sit by and do nothing and watch this. So if you turn in your Bibles to uh, Nehemiah chapter 1, it'll be up on the screen. You know, uh, certain verses uh, that, that I want to look at, but I wanted to read the uh, first chapter for you. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile. In the province, they are in grace, the wall of with fire. I sat down and wept for some days. I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. That's through verse 4. The reason I wanted to focus on uh, certainly the prayer life of Nehemiah. He, there are 12 prayers in the book of Nehemiah. 12 prayers. But we're going to see just how much he invested in prayer. There's 12 that are listed, but thousands that we know that he took part in. 
thousands of hours in prayer. Uh, Nehemiah 2.18 says, So they began the good work. That's what I want to talk about during this season. If you're hungry to do more, if you're not satisfied with the things that you're seeing in your life and only you can say what that thing is that breaks your heart, if you want to make a difference, this is going to be life-changing for you. And let's pray. Father, we do ask that you would come in a powerful way to us. We ask that your Holy Spirit would, would stir us to believe that we could do exceedingly and abundantly more, God, by your power to make a difference in the lives of, of the people that we uh, know and that we live around and with. God, give us the, the, the courage and the faith to step out. Speak to our hearts, Lord. Uh, speak to our hearts to stir us, to, to use the gifts uh, of, of those who love you to make a difference in the lives of other people and to glorify you, God, in all that we do. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, the one who gave us this perfect work. And we pray amen and amen. Now we're going to let the good work begin. So one of the most uh, motivating and and inspirational stories in the Old Testament is this one about Nehemiah. He's an ordinary guy, and that's what I like about him. Uh, he made an extraordinary difference in his life, but he is just a normal guy. He's not a pastor. He's not a preacher. He's not a, you know, a scholar or a prophet or a warrior or a king. He's just an everyday normal guy who happens to work for the most powerful king in the country or in the region, you know, uh, just like anyone here in this church. One person, an ordinary guy. But he saw something when his brother came to visit him that broke his heart. And it compelled him to do something about it. And we see uh, what he did. Now, Nehemiah, just to, to give you some background, Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king. You know, you know, you're asking, you know, what's a cupbearer? Well, uh, Artaxerxes was the king, and the kings in those days had someone to test the food that, uh, that was prepared for them because, you know, it could be poisoned or it could just taste bad. Uh, you know, he never ate Brussels sprouts, apparently, because they taste bad. And Nehemiah would say, mm, no, take that back and wrap it in bacon and put some sriracha sauce on it, and then maybe he'll take it. But, you know, Nehemiah, so Nehemiah did have an important job. You know, he probably was compensated. We know he was compensated quite well because he could take a, a drink of wine and it could be his last to protect the king. He was like a servant or a butler and he tested everything that the king would, would eat as a, as a cupbearer. Artaxerxes was the king of Persia. So he had integrity. He was trustworthy. Uh, he was honorable. He was always with the king. So he had private conversations. He heard private conversations that the king would have with other people. He was in the inner circle. He was a trusted, intimate uh, servant. He had knowledge that other people didn't have. And over time, if conditions are right, he would become a, a friend and provide advice to and from. And the cupbearer role... Uh, was a very, very important one because there were always plots to kill the king. So on one regular day, his brother comes in to talk to him about what's happening with the Jews, the remnant that are back in Jerusalem. And he hears this news and it changes his life. Verse 2 says, Hannah, one of my brothers came from Judah with some other men and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also... Jerusalem. So he asked him questions. Well, tell me about what's going on. Like, what's our people? How are our people doing? How is our homeland? And he gets this story. See, 140 years earlier, in uh, 586 BC, the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar come in and they, they sack Jerusalem. They take all the people captive, a couple million people, and they take them to Babylon. 
They destroyed the city, the walls, the, the temple. You know, they desecrated everything that had to do with, uh, with uh, the, the Israelites, the Jewish uh, people. Solomon's temple was burned to the ground. Every building was in rubble. The gates were burned. So there was absolutely no protection in the city. And back in those days, the walls and the city gates stopped bad people coming in and taking whatever you had. So everything that they knew was gone. And the Babylons <coughs> excuse me, took all of the Jews captive. They were demoralized. They had no hope, no future. There was nothing that they could do uh, about the, uh, the city and the condition of it. So decades later, Artaxerxes says, you know, you can go back to your city. Of the two million Jews that are in, uh, under Persian rule, in captivity, only 50,000 people went back to Jerusalem to rebuild. Verse 3, they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the governance in the province, are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. There's no wall. There's no protection. They're vulnerable to everyone and anyone who would come through. There's no leadership, no direction, no confidence, no plan, no hope, nothing for them. <clears throat> so how do you begin this, this good work that we're talking about? Well, first thing Nehemiah does, did you see that? He sits down and he cries. The first thing he does is he sits down and he cries. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept in verse 4. He was devastated. He's a broken man. His heart is broken because of what he's just heard about his people and his homeland. It would have been easy for Nehemiah to just shake it off. I mean, he's a thousand miles away. It's like when we hear something in, in Africa or Christians persecuted in, in Egypt or in China. It's, it's far away from us. He could have done the same thing, just shaked it off. People in Jerusalem were struggling. Not the people that were right there in his own neighborhood. They were doing all right. He's at the palace. He's eating the same food as the king, as King Artaxerxes. You know, he's watching his favorite TV shows and streaming Netflix on Friday nights. It's a great life for him. When we see something that comes into our lives, we have a choice to make the same one that Nehemiah has made. We could push the pain away. We could ignore it. It's so far away, it doesn't have any impact on us. Or we could do what Nehemiah does and choose to let that pain in. The burden that our brothers and sisters in Christ are carrying, whether it's across the city or across the country or across the world, you can choose to push it away or you can choose to let it in and let it affect you. He didn't just think of the, the heartbreaking plight of people, he let it get into his head and soak down deep into his heart. And so he sat and he cried. He cried and he wept bitterly for his people. The question for each one of us is, what breaks your heart? There's so many things that are going on in the world today. Maybe it's children in the education, children that can't read, that are graduating from our from our schools, and they still have a, a fourth or fifth grade reading level. Maybe it's that that breaks your heart. Or the special needs of children today that are being overlooked. They're being thrust into environments where they just can't succeed. They can't keep up. They can't learn. They're bullied and neglected and abused. Maybe it's people who are bound by addiction, drugs and alcohol. Pornography. They're trapped in that lustful prison of porn. I'm proud of the state of Texas. The state of Texas took, Sharon, remind me, the Pornhub. They took Pornhub to court and said that now it's a state law that you have to give, like, your real name and age and, well, I don't know, credit card, something, 
in order to log on to those porn sites here in Texas. And guess what that does? That shuts down Pornhub. Because if you're a politician or a pastor or a teacher or a child and you have to enter in your information, you're not going to do it. That helps battle. That's smart thinking. We're going back to how can we fix this, not let's patch it up here at the end. Hostage to drugs. Maybe it's homelessness. Like the organization that Sharon works for, people who've been trafficked and used and abused from a young age until they're now adults and they have no idea that there's anything else out there that they can do. They're held hostage. Preventable diseases, people who live without clean drinking water. There's so many things. What breaks your heart? I know uh, one of the big things that we've discussed before is is maybe you're called to speak on, on behalf of the unborn or the elderly, the two ends of the life spectrum that are vulnerable peoples who are taken advantage of all the time. You need to find something or realize and pull that thing down that breaks your heart. And you have a choice to make. You can push it away or you can let that pain in and do something about it like Nehemiah did. I remember at a pastor's uh, interfaith council in North Carolina at one of our churches, and uh, in that interfaith council, I had a couple pastors from some other denominations that uh, would pull me aside as the Salvation Army uh, pastor and officer and say, uh, we're going to send these people to you. We've got three or four people that, you know, really just don't fit in with the culture of our church, and we want to send them to you. Yeah, you're allowed because you know exactly what didn't fit in with the culture of their church. They didn't dress the same way. They didn't smell the same way. They were homeless, or they had addictions, or they had some kind of a problem that they were those people, and they didn't fit in with their congregation. Back before I became a Salvation Army officer, that's what broke my heart. It was more geared towards the focus that Sharon and I took when we were much younger and I had less gray hair. I had more hair and it was less gray. It was with children that we saw who were rejected and desperately needed some place to go that was safe and would give them something more than a bag of groceries for the weekend. And that's why we chose, one of the main reasons we chose the Salvation Army. It broke our hearts to see. And when you see that thing, you sit down and you cry about it. Then you let it in. Feel that pain. Embrace that burden and make it your own. You know, I'm with, a, I heard a, another pastor talk about this and he said, he said, I don't worry anymore when something causes me to sit down and cry. He says, I worry when it's been a long time since I've sat down and cried about something. Because then I'm pushing things away. I'm not letting that pain in. What breaks your heart and causes you to sit down and cry? Then the second thing, Nehemiah uh, chapter 1, verse 4. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. The second thing we do is we kneel down and pray, just like Nehemiah did. If it's a problem that's big enough to pray about, to cry about, it's big enough to pray about. If it's a problem that's big enough to cause you to fall down on your knees and cry about it, then it's a problem that's big enough for you to get on your knees, stay there, and pray about it. Take it to God. Now, I think that's crazy that, that we, and I do this too, go through a situation where it's breaking apart, everything's falling apart, and I finally say, you know what, I, I, just, I need to go before the Lord and pray. Prayer is not a last resort. You know, oh, well, now you 
the problem is bigger than me. So I'm going to go to the God of the universe, the creator and ruler who spoke everything in existence. I'm going to give it to him to let him take care of it because I can't at this point. You go to God first, not last. And you go to God all the way through that program. If you're waiting until the problem is too big for you to handle and then you're going to God, you got it backwards. Flip it around. You embrace that burden, but you got to give it to God from the very beginning. And I know, we think this all the time. I, I think that when I look at some of the situations that are going on in the world today, I'm only one person. What can I do about all of that? I can't do anything. I can't fix that. No, I can't. I can't do anything on my own. But God who dwells within me, who causes my heart to break over that situation, He can do something not to me, not just to me, but through me. To make a difference. Invoke the God of heaven. Here's something you've probably heard. God plus one is always a majority. Verse 5 and 6. Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keeps his commandments, and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayers Your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. And then a little while later, Nehemiah confesses sins. He confesses his people's sins, his father's sins, his own sins. And then he reminds God of God's promises. How do you think that God would respond to that? Well, obviously, he responds pretty favorably. Moses did it. Here, Nehemiah is doing it. Remember the promises that you made to your people, Lord. And he, his, his faithfulness. He, Nehemiah, a, a mere mortal man, reminds God that he is always faithful. And so, Nehemiah goes back before the king. And he asks permission to leave. And to rebuild his hometown. Verse 11 says, Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man uh, to God about the king. And Nehemiah goes before the Lord. See, because the king knew something was bothering Nehemiah. He knew him well enough when he came in after he heard that news, after he cried about it and spent hours on his knees praying about it. And he's standing before the king. The king says, "What's, What's going on, Nehemiah? And Nehemiah then sends up a, a little short flare prayer, you know, right there. It says he prays to the Lord. It's one of those, here I am, Lord, I'm right in this place. Give me the words to say. And this is important. What you pray about reflects what you believe about God. What you pray about reflects what you believe about God. You know, if you pray... You know, bless my food three times a day, and in the morning you pray, Lord, let me have a good day, and at night you say, Lord, thank you for the day that I had. That's the minimum. The Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean you close your eyes while you're driving and you whisper up a prayer. You know, that's for people who live in California and, and uh, northeast Iowa. <laughs> Sorry, Tracy. It means that everything that I do is a prayer. You know, you hit a green light and you say, thank you, Jesus. There's a prayer. You hear about something happening at work and you say, Lord, help us with this. Joe and I were coming back from a, an engagement uh, on Friday and Rodfield Road was closed down because of this accident. All five lanes were closed down. And we immediately said, Lord, protect whoever was involved in that accident. Please, Lord, let no one have lost their lives. It's praying conversationally. That's all it is, is a conversation that you have with your father. It's not enough just to pray three times for, for your meals and to keep you safe and have a good day. Pray that, that God would reveal his glory, reveal the work that he has for us, reveal how we should act in that work. Pray, Lord, stretch me, empower me, use me for something today. 
As I, as I mentioned earlier, 12 prayers are recorded in the book of Nehemiah. It starts and ends with prayer. That's what I love about Nehemiah. He bathes everything in prayer. And you know what that makes him? That makes him this brilliant strategist for getting things done. Because the wisdom that he prays for, God gives generously to those who ask it. So he goes to the city and he investigates. He checks out the wall, and the temple and the buildings. And then he gets before the people and he casts this vision. This is what it can be again. Then he strategizes and he delegates. There's opposition. There are obstacles. There are challenges. But all of that is covered by intense and intimate prayer to the Lord. Every step of the way. He's a, he's a leadership genius. He models for us what a leader, an effective godly leader, looks like. All of those things he does and he bathes them in prayer. So how do you begin the good work? Well, you sit down and cry. Something breaks your heart. You sit down and you cry about it. But then there's a point where you start to do something. And the first thing you do is you get on your knees and you pray to the one who has the answers, has the resources, has the solution. And you ask him to empower you to get it done. And then the third thing you do, what we see from Nehemiah, is you stand up and you get busy. You stand up and act. Do something. Tears turn to prayers. And his prayers drove him to do something, to act. We know how the story went. He took wine to the king, his heart was heavy, and the king notices and says to him in chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, the king said to me, what is it you want? And then he sends up this prayer, this flare prayer. I love that phrase. Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it, so that I can rebuild it. He says, my people are hurting. They're in danger. The walls are down. The, the gates are burned. The city is exposed and vulnerable. Somebody's got to do something. It might as well be me. So he steps out in faith. I, I've talked about this before. Sharon and I, at 50 years old, um, stepped out in faith from an organization that we've been with for over 20 years, not knowing what was going to happen the next day, stepped out in faith, and eventually, with folks like Steve, Mary, and, and Joe, and Patsy, and, well, Bob and Judy were late, but they're still here, and they're doing what we need to do, uh, and, and Doug and Sherry, who retired to God's other promised land, Florida. And we came together, and at 54, 53 years old, we started this church. And people were like, are you insane? There are churches on every corner in Corpus Christi. And then one person said to me, one pastor said to me, who's retired, who shall, shall not be named, he said, but the city can always use another God-fearing, Bible-believing, Christ-centered church. So do what God has put within you, a burning desire, something that's caused you to fall to your knees in prayer. Just step out and do it. And at another church that I served at, they, they had this phrase that they would say, come just as you are, but we don't want you to stay that way. And that's exactly what caused me to go before the Lord and say, all right, I, I get the picture, God, but I'm not the right person. And God said, Be, because I, I don't know anything about starting a church. I've been in this, this uber-organized paramilitary church, and now I'm going to something that has no rules and no nothing and, and because I haven't put them together. What do I know about that, Lord? And he said, that's the exact reason why you're going to do this. Because you can't do it on your own, and you just said that you can't. I'm going to do it through you. I'm going to bring people to create this thing, this body of believers, this faith family 
to do exactly what I've called it to do, not what you or what Joe or what anyone else has said. It's what God wants you to do and to be in the community. Somebody's got to do something. Might as well be us. Now, I could have given all kinds of excuses, and I did. I said I was too busy. I, I can't do this thing. I can't make a big difference. I'm just one person. It's, it's a job for someone else to do. And it's true. I can't do everything, but I can do something. And that's what we all need to do. Sit down and cry. Find what breaks your heart. Sit down and cry about it. Then get on your knees and pray about it. And then stand up and take action. Do something. Stand up and act. And this is the, uh, this is not mine, but it's so good I had to use it. Life Church had this little bullet that says, you don't have to be appointed by man if you are called by God. Isn't that good? You don't have to be appointed by man if you're called by God. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. That should be a clap. It should be a huge clap. Because that means it doesn't matter if you have, you know, degrees behind your name. It doesn't matter. The most wise person that I had ever met in ministry was a guy named Harold Ray Vincent, Owensboro, Kentucky. Now, Harold Ray would mispronounce words all the time, but he was the smartest man of God that I'd ever met. He dropped out of school in third grade to go work in his, his family farm because they had to during the Depression or whatever. But God gave him this wisdom that you can't get in a university, that you can't get anywhere but from him when you're out working with your hands and, and learning from him directly through his spirit. The wisest man I'd ever met. You don't have to be appointed by man if you're called by God. And then what do you do? You let the good work begin. I'm going to tell you about some good work examples that Sharon and I have, uh, have experienced over the years at the Salvation Army Proctor in uh, uh, Ocean Springs, the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Um, there was a young woman that worked for us named Haley, Haley Moon. Her parents must have been hippies. I don't know. But anyway, uh, she was a great young woman, just got married. They got pregnant, and she had a miscarriage. And it so broke her heart to lose this child that they started counseling to help families who'd been through the same thing, who'd lost children through miscarriages. And now she's created a nonprofit called Peter's Friends. I don't know the, the uh, details behind Peter's Friends, but she's, she, she cried about it. And we cried with her. And then she got on her knees and prayed about it. And then she got up and she took action. And then Vandora Wilson, or Vandora Patterson in Wilson, North Carolina. She was in her 60s when we first met her. And she had this passion for teenagers, for kids. And every Sunday morning, she would drive her van to their homes to pick them up to make sure they got to church because they didn't have anyone to get them ready. And come just as they were. That's what church is. Church is coming just as you are. Craig Grishel says, we have a dress code here. Our dress code is, please do. Doesn't matter what you wear, just wear something. I like that. That's the kind of church this church is and will be. Our dress code is going to be like that. Come just as you are. But know that you're not going to leave the same way that you came in. Yeah. And then uh, Craig, it's from another church, but Craig talks about this 10-year-old girl, Addison. Uh, when she was 7 years old, Addison learned that uh, uh, Maureen in Kenya didn't have access to clean water. So for two and a half years, this 10-year-old this girl, she's, she runs three half marathons and raised over $80,000. A 10-year-old girl raised over $80,000 so that she could provide clean water to 1,600 children. 
Isn't that amazing? A 10-year-old girl whose heart was broken, who probably cried and prayed, and God said, do this. This is what you can do. You can't do everything, but this is what you can do. What breaks your heart? What causes you to fall on your knees and look to the Lord of heaven and say, help me do something? Pray with me. Lord, as we go through this uh, series, we would ask that you would continually bring to the forefront of our minds and soak down into our heart those things that do break our hearts, those things that do uh, matter in your kingdom and allow them, Lord, to matter in our hearts, that we would fall to our knees in prayer and you would speak to us as we commune with you and then we would stand up to take action and do something that matters, something that outlasts us, that is born in the kingdom of heaven and exists throughout eternity. We pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes to those things and speak to us through your word during this new season. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.